uh, Stephen Frost, thanks for joining me here on the Need to Know Comedy channel. So um, I'm going to start off by just saying, like, you grew up in a fairly artistic family, didn't you? Your, your father is an artist. Yes. Yeah, my dad was uh, from the, um, after the war, he moved down to uh, St. Ives in Cornwall, which was the hotbed of modern art, abstract art in the 50s. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on a beach in St. Ives for five years while he was painting red and black circles for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you're at school, they say, what did your dad do? What did your dad do? And I say, he paints circles. <laughs> Actually, he's a painter. He's a painter. Yeah, two coats, one day, two coats. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, very, very artistic. So my house is full of paintings, which is fantastic. That's really nice, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, it wasn't a big leap for you to, to think about a career no, in the arts. In fact, it was, um, you know, like you say, when you're at school, all your mates are getting qualifications or going to university. That was never on the cards. It was always going to be something artistic. My two brothers, two, elder, two of my elder brothers were artists. Um, I, I, and I always wanted to act, so I went to drama school. And you didn't need to get any qualifications in those days. Right, okay. Uh, and uh, what made you then uh, veer towards comedy? Was it just something well, that was it, happening naturally? It, well, yeah, it was weird because I went to drums to learn to act. Not not to, not you can learn to act, but you know, three years, years experience that. And to be an actor. Hmm. But I did have this thing where, like, I remember doing Chekhov. At, I love Chekhov at drama school. I was doing the cherry tree. I was playing the parking, the man who, the newcomer who buys the cherry orchard, you know, and it's very, very dramatic. And, um, and the, uh, the, the director said, just now remember, Chekhov is funny. This is a funny play. Uh, a lot of people take it too seriously. It's funny. I was there with my then to be double act partner, Mark Harden. So, all right. So I came on and did my big, I've just bought the uh, cherry orchard speech. And she, she went, stop. It's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> you said it was funny. But yeah, there was a natural bent for it. But when, when we left drama school and we were out of work for a long time, we decided to get an act together. And once we got the act together, the Oblivion Boys, uh, we got picked up by TV. So we were just off straight up like that. But, you know, the acting, straight acting was just left behind. It, and it wasn't a plan. We just did that while we were out of work, you know, simple as that. Yeah, that's, so that was you and Mark Arden, uh, the Oblivion yeah. Boys. And yeah. did you start off doing uh, uh, live shows? It, it, they, like, I presume the comedy alternative scene was burgeoning around that time. So Yeah, we were, we were sort of in the, at the beginning of that. You know, we went along to see Alexi Sale at the comic strip uh, mm. an old strip play. we said oh yeah we want to do that you know and so we just said can we have a gig and he said yeah and then we did the comedy store in london for years all three venues you know yeah and uh then what was the first tv work you did well we were we were doing we were doing the late night shows at the comedy store two o'clock in the morning ben elton was comparing mm. and he said uh we've written this sitcom we think you two would be good in it and Mark, do you want to play the part of the the, the wide boy with the, with me and Rick Mail and uh, and uh, Nigel Plainer and Aid Edmondson? Mark said, "No, I've just got a job. I'm doing Panto in Sheffield." Really? <laughs> he was going to be one of the main four guys, you know. Um, was it M Mike? You know, the cool one, the shades on all the time. Little, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. For that, I went out on, on stage and Mark said, "No, I'm doing Panto." <laughs> no way. We didn't, we didn't know. He said, "No, we're doing this pilot." I didn't know what the word pilot meant. And then, so anyway, about six months later, Ben came up to us and, and Rick said, look, well, anytime there's two people, we'll get you to it because you're really, we really like you as a double A. So in a way it worked out in my favor because otherwise I wouldn't have got the job. Right, right, <laughs> so right, right. We were doing that, filming that. And then the producer, Paul Jackson, lovely bloke. He'd done, all, he'd done the two Ronnies and all that, but he was really new his stuff. And he's really good to all us young comedians. He, yeah. um, he said, we're doing a, a, a carrot, uh, Jasper Carrot. Now, Jasper Carrot is a famous British comedian oh, from yeah. Birmingham. He was doing a carrot thing called Carrot Lib. Uh, and it was a live show, Saturday night TV live show. And they wanted funny actors to do the sketches. Mm. We weren't into sketches and all that sort of thing. But he said, yeah, all right. And so while we were filming The Young Ones, we went straight back to London and uh, did live TV comedy. Uh, before the young ones came out, so we were on scene on that before that came out. So it was all pretty crazy, yeah. And I want to be an actor. I wanted to do Shakespeare. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And you were, uh, uh, you did the Carling Black Label ads as well. Yeah, again, kind of yeah, that was just, you know, we're on stage at the comedy store messing around. Mm. And then as actors, we, we had separate agents and we get put up for commercials all the time, which is great. And then, the, but this bloke just came up to us after the gig and said, you two were funny. Uh, do you want to do this commercial? We said, you're all right then. <laughs> and it lasted seven years. And they were wow. really funny. Well, really funny, you know. So yeah, funny. they're brilliant. I've just watched them. Uh, they're on YouTube. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. Have you seen the one of me naked in the laundrette? The one where uh, <laughs> it's a take on the Levi's ad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw it for the first time in years. I was in good shape in them days. Oh, in good shape. <laughs> and a hair, nice chest hair. <laughs> Not Excuse just. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 and uh, then the Black Adder as well. You were in Black Adder. Yeah, well, it's the same similar sort of thing. Me and Mark. Um, uh, that was um, John. Um, can't remember his name now. Again, a really, really nice TV producer. He knew us from the old days. He said, "Look, when there's two guards or something like that, we can get you in on that." Or and then the Firing Squad's the big one, mm -hmm. which uh, again Ben Elton said, "Look, here's this scene. We think you'd be really good in it, and uh, get some of your mates in." And um, it was semi improvised. So, because he knew I did all that caper as well. So it was good fun. So it's just a free reign, basically, you know, just doing the clubs and then getting picked up. Right, okay. And uh, so how did you get into the improv then? Was that so well, at always, the same time? Well, sort of. I, I always did improvising at college. At drama school, we just did it all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a class in it, but, you know, me and my mate, we just we, that's what we were like in the pub or afterwards uh, in our flats. We were just, you know, old Billy banter all the time. And then... Um, the comedy store, they started to do Whose Line Is It Anyway? And they went down the comedy store to look at uh, Paul Merton and uh, Kit Hollaback and Jeremy Hardy and, several, and Mike Myers. Mike Myers, they were all doing that impro show down at the comedy store. And because I knew all those guys, because they were all stand-ups as well, as you see. Mm. And they said, do you want to come on on a Sunday and join us? I said, yeah, and I really enjoyed it, you know, as a guest. And that sort of, but the first time I went down, the producer of Whose Line Was There? So I walked off stage. He said, do you want to do a TV show? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then I did God knows how many years of that. So it's fantastic. It's getting out and about. You've got to get out and about. Joe. Yeah. Just Other show your face. Yours. You've got to get out and about. You never know who's in. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and you recently were back doing His Lines Are Anyway at the Edinburgh Festival. Last yeah. Week. Yeah. We, they, and they occasionally do it live here in London, but we did a really, did a four week run in it, uh, last year. And then in, in two years before that, we did the run there. And it's great because everybody, it's, you know, it's about 900 seats or something. And it sells out. I mean, it's, after doing the Edinburgh Festival for 30 years and getting three people in, it's quite nice. To, uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I did. So uh, like, did you bring, back in the day, did you bring uh, a show to Edinburgh with the Oblivion Boys? Yeah, we did the Oblivion Boys. Cool. Uh, it was, must be 30 years ago now, but we supported Nigel Planer, who was do, playing Neil from The Young Ones. So he, right. So we went on and did 20 minutes and then got loads more laughs. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, then he came on and then we come out at the end to do a little bit together and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, we did the Oblivion Boys. And then I did the thing called The Wow Show, which was with Mark Harding and two other guys, Lee Corns and Paul Elliott, which was an anti-sketch theatre show. We used to get the audience out of the audience onto the street and shout at them and then go to the pub. Really? Yeah, yes. We got we made the quarterfinals, whatever they're called, the Perry Awards. We were we were we were in the last four. <laughs> Are you serious? Really? Yeah, 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 we got up there. And it was a show where you would take the audience out of the theatre. Yeah, we would we would come on well we'd do we'd do stuff, mess around with the audience. We always argued on stage and they never knew whether we meant it or not. And uh, you know, and I'd say things like halfway through the show, I'd just stop. And they said, what's the matter, Steve? I said, well, I do commercials. I, I make 40 grand a year. I don't need this shit. I don't need to be here. And I just walk off. Yeah. And the audience go, God, well, he does. We know. And then I wouldn't come back. And the others would go, well, we'll just have to, you know. Then I'd come back on and yeah, wind them up. But we used to wear balaclavas with ALF, uh, Audience Liberation Front. <laughs> and, and we were all called ALF. So you can imagine the comedy that ensued. <laughs> Come on, we come towards the end of the show. We come in and burst into the audience like the SAS and tell them to get out. You don't have to watch theatre, theatre's crap, opera's rubbish. Get out. There are pubs out there, there are people, the people to meet, and we'd usher them out and tell them to run free, run, run. And then we'd get on bikes and ride off or jump into taxis on the backs of lorries 
and just disappear. And that was the end of the show. I couldn't do that now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just sounds so amazing, so anarchic and... Yeah, it uh, was. It was. We were, we were fed up with footlights and sketch shows and things like that. You know, we just wanted to do something different. And it was. Right. Because, uh, like, I mean, the comedy at that time was would it, would it have been aligned with the punk scene, as in you wanted to break all the rules and... Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people started doing that, uh, you know, uh, breaking the rules of uh, <laughs> no beginning, middle and end and things. Like. We used to put a curtain halfway down the audience so only the front of the audience could see in the interval, hang it in the interval and say the people at the back aren't joining in, aren't, 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 you know, they're not. So we would do the show. And so the people would go, what the... And then it, <laughs> it would fall down on us, you know, while we try and put it back up. And then it would fall on us, make, we'd make sure it fall on us and there'd be some other people under it. And then we just get a pack of cards out and play poker. And so the audience could just hear us play poker with strangers. You know? Things like that, Joe. You know? Things like that. That sounds amazing. It kind of it makes me think of the Marx Brothers. That kind of... Yeah, just... it's like the Marx Brothers. And um, we were called the Marx Brothers on glue. That was one of our reviews. It was like the Marx... Yeah. Mar yeah, it was good old-fashioned vaudeville, but with an alternative bent, you know. we do a yeah. mock alternative... A, a cabaret in it. I was a, I was a puppeteer. I had a hand puppet called Reg Prince, and I, I was, uh, he who did impressions, I didn't do them, the puppet did them. Yeah. And, you know, I'd just go like, things like, I'd go, <laughs> that's the puppet. Really? I'd just go, I'd go, Napoleon, and, you know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but I would also an avant-garde jazz vocalist. So I'd do, an impression of the, you see where we, well, we, I was, uh, mm, yes. Sounds oh. like when I talk about it like that. <laughs> oh, but it sounds amazing. Yeah, I yeah. love it. A bit like, you know, you know, you, you know Paul Curry, don't you? It's a bit like that. Yeah, oh, I love Paul Curry. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. And did you uh, do shows with punk bands? Did, like, I think you said, I think yeah. you talked before you opened for... Yeah, we opened for a couple, which was... Um, it made that really hard up. You think a late night crowd at three o'clock in a comedy club is tough when they've come to see <clears throat> who did we support? I can't remember who we supported now because the bands loved us, you know. When they yeah. and also you, uh, the damned used to, when they were on the young ones, say, oh, we love you guys, you can come with us. Well, they don't want to see two blokes no. trying to be witty banter with this microphone while the guys are setting up. Several times the bands would come on while we're doing our set because they thought we were roadies fucking about. So we developed a routine where we come on as roadies, wow. all the black with keys hanging off, and we do um, with our, our, you know, our arse cracks showing, bending over and with cables and that sort of thing. And then people get start, you know, look at us, and then we go, do, "Do you want to do a sound check? Do you want to? Do you want to? Want to? Want to? Want to?" <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then, you know, there was loads of things we did, but we only lasted about five minutes, you know, because they just throw bottles at you. They want to see the band, don't they? Yeah, like, it was like the punk movement. It was like you just doing your own thing and breaking the rules in the comedy circuit. Anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I quite often the bands think, "Oh, it's great, a great idea to put comedy on yeah. before a band," but yeah. it's not. It's not no, really. It's not. No, no. It's like putting a juggler on before the opera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think uh, the police didn't they get um, uh, one of the old comedians to come on, and he was yeah, he was tough. Tough going, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, Phil Jupiter's, he, went, he used to go on quite a lot before Madness. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, great because he saw the band, but he, he got bottled off most times. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Me and Paul Tyler were on before therapy one night. I mean, oh, therapy. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. you're very similar to uh, heavy metal, Irish heavy metal, aren't you? <laughs> Well, uh, well, our acts became very fast and loud. <laughs> yes, that's it. You speed up. Getting the only, in. The only way Cut to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, like, I mean, then you, did, uh, you've you done improv now for a long time. Would that, would that be mainly what you do now? Yeah, that's the most... I, mean, I used to... After the double act split up, musical differences, he wouldn't give me back my Lindisfarne album. Um, he, <laughs> yeah. I started comparing a lot, and I was comparing a lot, which I really enjoyed. And by comparing, you don't really need any material. <laughs> and, and I knew most of the comedians, and most of the acts. And then from that, while that happened, I started doing the impro 
live. And then I formed my own impro troupe. We got people in, any people who wanted to do it, as you know. Mm -hmm. But while I was comparing, I got asked to introduce bands. So I went back to the bands. And so I'd be at the festivals here in the UK introducing bands, which was fantastic. Really? Now you don't have any material then. You just got to remember the name of the band. And that's quite difficult sometimes after day three. <laughs> <laughs> the band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I know. I went out once. There's fourteen thousand people, and I, you know, I write it down on the on a piece of paper. That's all written up. There they are. In the, yeah. And I, I'll say your name. As soon as I say your name, you come on. I'm not doing any jokes. Don't I don't worry about that. Ladies and gentlemen, of course I can't remember the name. <laughs> so I go, who do you want us? Who have you come to see? <laughs> and they'll shout. You know, the so and sos. I say, well, here they are. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, and did you work with, uh, what's his name? Uh, who did Call Baby? That's really free. John Otway. Oh, John Otway, yeah, I used to work a lot with him. He, um, he, became, he became a friend of mine because I just, I was sort of a fan. I loved uh, his, that song. God, just nonsense. Oh, not now. Not now. Um, I'll turn that off. That's somebody else trying to organise things. Um, he, we were we were in the we got flown over to New York to do this Wow show I was telling you about. God knows how that happened. We, they flew us over, and they put us in the Danceteria, which is not there anymore in New York, which was a famous discotheque, and it's about ten stories high. It's on the it's on the tenth floor downtown New York, mm. and we were on at midnight. And uh, John Otway was on before us, and I can't I can't believe this. It's John Otway, so I said, "Oh, mate, I'm a, you know, I, love, I love what you're doing." Just one thing. Um, we need a guitar for one of our anti-sketches. And he had his Gibson SG, you know. And I said, is there any chance? Because the lad said, go and ask John Otway, you like him. Lend I said, look, these rock stars won't lend you guitars. They won't even let you look at them, let alone give you their guitar for a comedy sketch. Yeah. So I walked in and introduced myself. He's the other side of the dressing room. I said, is there any chance we could borrow your guitar? <laughs> and he just picked it up like that and just went, threw it at me. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. I thought, I like this bloke. And uh, we became friends, and then uh, we did a couple of videos with him. Me and Mark, the double act, did a couple of videos with him, and he's still a good friend of mine now. And I go on tour with him, and my band plays with him sometimes, supports him. Really? Wow. Yeah. I saw him live uh, uh, the festival. He was on after Squeeze and before the yeah. Amazing. Yeah, okay. And uh, you did you work with Steve Harley, the Cockney Rebel? No. What happened there? <laughs> <laughs> What happened there was, it was at the Gilded Balloon, uh, at the old Gilded Balloon, the one that burnt down. Mm. And um, uh, I was, uh, the, 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 there was an Australian act called the Gadflies, I don't even remember them. And they used to play, they're a, a four piece combo, playing song, their own songs, and they were upstairs in the little studio. And they used to ask people to come on. And then um, Steve Harley, was in town, so they asked him. That's one of my favourite songs. Come up and see me, make me smile. Mm. And Mr. Soft, I think, are brilliant. I, you know, I always loved them. I've never met the man, and uh, I, they asked me to come up and play a, a bit of guitar and a couple of my songs, which I did. But Steve Harley went on first, <coughs> and he was um, <coughs> to say that he was a bit of a pain in the ass. He was a rock star, and he was, you know, asking for riders and things. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. You know. It's, it's late night and there's you know, people you know, also, he was moan, 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 moan and then he came on with his guitar beautiful semi-acoustic black epiphone played it and he stopped halfway through the song and said this is a 1500 pound guitar and these speakers are making it sound shit and then he did come up and see me and he doesn't play the lead on that it's Nick Pinn plays the lead on, on the ding, 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 ding. he's brilliant anyway he sort of walked off to this you know, then they asked me to come on and I sat down I had a old guitar. I'd never played with the band before. I just said, you know, E G E G one two three four, and then follow it. I went fifteen quid sounds fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I got a standing ovation. And people were asking for my, at the end. People were asking for my autograph. And Steve Harley standing, <laughs> and no one is talking to him. Oh, that's <laughs> class. And um, and. The, uh, when's the first time? I know you do Glastonbury every year as well. And when, yeah. when, when did you first do Glastonbury? 
it must have been about 25, I mean, it's 50 years. It was the 50th, wasn't it? We missed because of the yeah, yeah, yeah. pandemic. So I must have been doing it for 25 years. So 25 years ago, yeah. What was it like then? Back, uh, uh, back. Well, pretty much like well, I've been there with you. It was, um, it, it was pretty wild. Uh, but again, that was Haggis and Arabella Churchill, who's no longer with us. They were in Edinburgh and they saw the WOW show. And they said, do you want to come down to uh, Glastonbury? And we said, we'd love to come to Glastonbury. We can't, we've always wanted to go, but we couldn't get in. And so we got in with that wacky show, which didn't work <laughs> uh -huh. in, in the comedy tent. You know the comedy tent. It's, yeah. hard, have, it's hard work at the best of times. You know, if you're, if you're doing messing around with four of you on stage, one of you on the stage. I know it's hard work. I've seen you, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I said to Haggis and Arabella, I said, well, look, I don't think that works because it's, it's theatre based, but we do do impro. And they said, well, bring your impro team down, which you've done with me. And it's, yeah. it's hard work, but it's great fun, isn't it? Ah, oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the noise around you and all the stuff going on out there, the big stage and everything. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally different to a normal gig and all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. someone might start uh, sand checking their snare drum yeah. while they're on stage. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, no, but 25 years ago, it was, I was stunned by it. I couldn't believe that the size of it and the... I didn't see any bands. I saw bands, but I didn't see the ones on the main stage. You, you, you can go there, you know, I'm down there for five days. You can, there's so much to do, as you know. It's just, you know, I like the little tents where there's a crazy little reggae band on or ska band up the hill somewhere or something like that, you know. Ah, to me. And I, saw, the... I saw more bands this year on TV because <laughs> it was, you know, it was called off. I saw more bands at Glastonbury this year than I have been going in 25 years. <laughs> yeah, right. I, like, I know, I've seen you there. <laughs> you just hang around the, the, the uh, artist bar most of the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that, which is a charity. It's a Children's World charity. All the profits go to Children's World charity. And I got a, a message from the head barman, Bill, who you'd know if you saw him, mm. saying, we miss you and your brother the charity is losing so much money because you and your brother aren't here drinking beer all day. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a class bar. It's so good. And the bands that play in there are, are well, amazing. Squeeze played in there. I saw Squeeze play in there. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and you've, so you've toured all over the world. Like uh, you've been to where Hong Kong and the Middle East. Yeah, and... that's a shame. I don't think we're going to Hong Kong. Well, I'm not going anywhere at the moment. Obviously, Hong Kong, but Hong Kong was brilliant. Been going there for 25 years. And yeah. China, mainland China, Beijing and Shanghai. I love, I love um, Shanghai. It's great. It reminds me of, well, so Hong Kong, New York. Uh, crazy. Yeah. And we do a lot in Ireland, of course. Love coming over to Galway and Dublin. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, Azerbaijan is, is what, um, Baku in Azerbaijan. That's one of my favorites. And Dubai and Muscat and Oman. <clears throat> All those deserts yeah. on the back. I think I swam in a wadi with you in Oman. Yeah. We were in Oman, yeah. yeah. We went to a, a wadi, yeah. <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, that trip was incredible. That's five years ago now, I think. We yeah. were yeah. in um, what, Qatar, Oman, yeah. Bahrain, and Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Qatar. <laughs> What's the, uh, what was it you said about the, the airline? Oh, yeah, they're, they're, um, they're called Qatar, Qatar it's Q. U A T A R, and it's spelled, it's pronounced Qatar, Arabic Qatar, and they're called Qatar Airways. And I've actually got an executive membership, you know, one of those cards they give you because you fly so many times with them. And uh, and I actually met the boss, and I said, "You're missing a trick there. You should be called Air Qatar." <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I've been> <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm afraid. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, I've used that joke a few times. <laughs> you can have it. You can have it. Ah, oh, yeah, it's class, Because yeah. you need it. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, you, you, uh, you've seen, like, the comedy scene change. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to the comedy scene now, but do, do you think <coughs> there, there's a, you know, it's, you, you're talking about a very anarchic kind of time, yeah. and then it, it's kind of gone very mainstream now. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's inevitable, isn't it? Because, it, you know, we thought we were breaking the mould from the old guys in dinner jackets and talking about their wives being fat and, you know, mother-in-laws, which did happen. We changed all that. And then it sort of went for 10 years. That was great. And then, of course, people get asked to do things like commercials and, learning, and, get paid and other TV stuff. And then it went sort of full circle. And then it, about 10 years ago, it was very laddish. It was men in suits again. 
talking about yeah. their girlfriends and uh, you know problems and things like that. Uh, and some of them, yeah, but you know, like but if, uh, you, if you were starting out, say now or maybe ten years ago, even. Uh, do you think you would have done comedy or would you have done something else? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, but I'd try to rip it up. I always try and do something different, really, you know, because a lot of the stuff is, is very same-ish, isn't it? Yeah. But, you, know, you, know, like, I, I, you know, the stories about, I've, I've gigged a few times at Malcolm Hardy. I mean, if you can tell people about Malcolm Hardy, people <laughs> don't know who he was. He was Malcolm was, was, uh, was the, probably the nicest, generous man I've ever met, but he was an absolute maverick in the comedy world. He ran a club called Up the Creek, which is down in Greenwich at Deptford, because it's that, there's a creek that goes into the River Thames there. And that was a tough club. It used to be behind a, an oil refinery, the Blackwell Tunnel, and that, I got, that's the only time I've been bottled off by a comedy crowd, cut my head open there, glass in the head, for being funny. You're great, mate, <laughs> you know. That was what that was, and blood pouring out of And I went, I went off, they were hardcore, they were a really hardcore crowd. And I went up to the back of the, I just went, walked off the stage to the bar at the back of the room, and I just, it, it wasn't serious, it was only a little thing. Like that. And I said, listen, I'm, I don't do this for that, I do it to make people laugh and get paid a bit of money, so I'm, I'm, I'm just walking home, I'm going. I got a pint at the back of the bar, Malcolm Hardy's at the bar, and said, oh, Mark, Mark, I'm still on stage. And he said, oh, well, go back up there. I said, no, I'm not going back. I've got to cut my head out. He said, all right. And he walked up and stood next to Mark. And he knew, he knew our act because he'd seen it so many years. And he finished it. <laughs> really? So like in a bar, like this, with blood in the eyes, watching my own act, getting really big laughs with Malcolm Hardy doing <laughs> but he But he ran a really good club because he would always get, he would always bring on new people. He wouldn't go for surefire hits. And in the end, the big names wanted to play the club because it was such a great atmosphere, apart from incidents like that. And, um, and he always brought on uh, speciality acts. Or, and he also brought on a lot of, um, what can we say, what, what, I, what I am now, elderly people. He brought on old vaudeville acts as well, you know. So it was a really good mixture, you know. Uh, but he was, he, was a, he was a brilliant compact because he'd go on and an act would do five minutes of paper tearing. <laughs> and then he'd go on and go, well, he was shit. Right, it's Steve Frost. <laughs> He, he ran he ran a good club and he was uh, but he was in the great show on legs you know they did they did the naked balloon dance yeah yeah they yeah. did and they they just had the balloons and they cover up the appropriate parts of the body <clears throat> they did that at Glastonbury they were a big hit at Glastonbury they were there quite a few times and he's famous for um, stealing yes. Freddie Mercury's birthday cake he stole Freddie Mercury's birthday they were booked for Freddie Mercury's birthday it's him Steve Bowditch and uh, Martin Soane. And uh, it was a cake the size of a, a pink Rolls Royce. <clears throat> and not many people were eating it. So he, they had a van. So they picked it up and put it in the back of his van. <laughs> Took it home, gave it to the kids and all that. <clears throat> <clears throat> the police came round. It's, it's, it sounds like a joke because it is. They followed the trail. <laughs> really, yeah. <laughs> cake crumbs. They just followed the cake crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> He opens the door, there's all these cake crumbs, pink cake crumbs all up to his door, and upturned pink uh, Rolls Royce made out of, you know, of cake mixture. Yeah. No? You know, he's no, no, I didn't. <laughs> Don't do it again. <laughs> That's class. But yeah. um, so listen, thanks for coming and, and chatting to me. And uh, this is the Need to Know comedy show. And because of that, I want you to tell me of an act that no, probably nobody's heard of no. and that you would recommend or you would say is one of your well, favourites. There's two actually. There's one, is, uh, he's been going as long as I have and he's, he's, uh, he doesn't get any better. He's not going to get any better. <laughs> and his name's Billy Bollocks and he's great. Uh, if you see him, Billy Bollocks, he just doesn't get booked because of that name. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he just goes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not really funny, really. And people laugh at that. And then he isn't really funny. And all the comedians laugh, but the punters just go, well, this is rubbish. But we're all laughing because he's not, you don't know whether he's an art student or he's just like that. I think he is. Yeah. But the, the one that I really like is, um, I've mentioned already, it's, it's Martin Sohn from The Great Show on Lakes. He was a mate of Malcolm Hardy's. Mm. Um, he, he runs a comedy club here called Pull the Other One. And he always gets really wacky people on, but he does, it, it's, it, like I say, he's a bit like Paul Cullery. He, he does um, 
although he's 40 years older than him. <laughs> yeah. He does, uh, like he, he come on with a, a plug from a, a bath, a sink, you know, the metal yeah, yeah, yeah. circuit bit that you put the plug in and the waste pipe. And then he'll, then he'll play uh, Santana's samba party. Dun, 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 that really slow, sexy Santana. And then you just get a, like this, he gets a bit of hair and pulls it out of the <laughs> and it gets longer. <laughs> You know, all that matted hair you get in your shower. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. As long as the record, it just pulls out. Oh! <laughs> to Santana. And then he'll go over to the... He has a big book, a joke book on stage, on a plinth. And he said, let's go over to the great book, joke book. And he opens it up, and there's a light inside. So when it opens up, it lights up, you know. But it also explodes. So he shuts it and he does another bit of acting. He comes, let's go over to the, he opens again and a boxing glove comes out, you know, the joke book. Wow. <laughs> then he opens it again, water comes out. <laughs> that sounds amazing. And I was doing, and I did the 1812 overture with him once. I played trumpet on the 1812 overture, that bit, the Battle of Waterloo bit. Yeah. He set off the cannons. He had a hundred party poppers stuck to a board. So, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Room full of smoke, and we go. So not many, not but not very verbal, not very Bill Hicks, but you know, funny. That's my not kind exactly of comedy. Right. And yeah. where where is this club? It's down here in uh, Nunhead, near with me in East Village, South East London. Pull the other one, it's called. All oh, right. Well, yeah. hopefully that'll be back open soon again. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Let's everything be open soon, yeah. Yeah. Um, but listen, thanks a lot for a chat. Well, it's nice to see you, Joe. You're looking well. 